a walk. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Odyssey Church. Um, and we want to say good morning to everybody. If it is your first time here and you don't know who I am, my name is Jennifer Weilman. I am the administrator, a.k.a. Web Guru, as Rob and Bryce have nicknamed me. And we want to welcome you to the Odyssey on this glorious spring day. Spring is here. Are we all excited? Spring is officially here as of Friday at 6.45 p.m. Spring is ushered in. And I don't know about you, but it was a long, hard, cold winter for me. And more than once, I would turn to somebody and go, this is not why I live at the beach. And they, nobody said to me, oh yeah, no, this is why I live here, for the snow and the bitter cold. Um, and we wonder why, but I was also reminded this week that winter is a necessity. Winter is the time the earth takes to regroup, refocus, and just kind of rest before everything starts to come alive again. And as I was driving around and walking around this week and I saw the grass turning green and heard the birds chirping and all of this stuff, I was reminded that winter is needed. And in the church, we kind of do the same thing. We're in the middle of a season of the church we call Lent. It is the 40 days before Christ's crucifixion and then resurrection on Easter Sunday. And Lent is the same as winter. It is a time for us to regroup refocus and remember before we start the amazing celebration of the, is the miracle of the resurrection. So if it is your first time here, we want to say welcome to the Odyssey Church. Um, if you've never filled out one of the green connection cards and the chairs in front of you, now's the time to do it and put it in the basket on the bookcase over there. If you have filled, if you filled one out but you have a special prayer request, something you want to talk about something you need prayer for, go ahead, put it on that card. If you want to call, put a note down. The only people who see those cards are Pastor Rob and myself, and we actually take that very seriously here, and that we are the only ones who see them because we want to be able to help you, but we know there's some things we just don't want to broadcast to the entire world. So put, them, put it down on the cards, and we will give you a call this week or email or however you would like us to reach out for you, even if you just want a prayer set for you. We have an amazing prayer team here at the Odyssey Church, and their prayers do get answered. Um, one of those prayers that we have been praying about was somebody to help us do the things we could not do. And if you've noticed, this week we have several changes. And that we yesterday we had a big spring cleaning day, and we made some changes, and one of the things was there was a lot of outside work done. Um, and that was the responsibility of one man. Randy Miller at the back. Yes. Let's give him a round of applause. Randy is out here bringing James this week, power washing the entire building. Yesterday he was here from 9 o'clock in the morning until probably close to 5 o'clock. He put the signs out on the highway. He did some landscaping work. And that is something that nobody else here at the Odyssey could do. And as I told Rob, God provides for what we need, not necessarily always what we want. And Randy was a need that we needed, so we just want to thank him. Um, because here at the Odyssey Church, we always want to help people. We always want to serve people. And that's why we call our lead team, we say we're mad. As you can see, we all have our shirts on today. Mad does not mean nuts, although we, some of us, me included, are a little crazy. Um, mad means making a difference. And we want to make a difference in our community. And it's because of people like Randy that we are able to help out. With that said, I just have a couple of announcements all about actually, not coincidentally, but godly, like coincidentally, like enough, that all actually are about the church making a difference in our community. First up is our Easter egg hunt. You've been hearing us talk about this for several weeks. It's actually next Saturday. If it rains, it'll be moved to Saturday after that. It's at the Selfieville Park on Route 54 on Park Street. If you don't know where that is, there will be banners. I've seen them hanging out. It is a completely free event. There'll be an Easter egg hunt for babies up to elementary school age kids. There'll be face painting, crafts, stories. The Odyssey Church will be there. How this came about was four churches got together, said let's do a community Easter egg hunt, pool our resources, and when the, and when the town found out about it, they jumped on board, and now we have the Selbyville town's helping out, the school's helping out, Dunkin' Donuts, Fishers, the library, a bunch of sponsors, a bunch of volunteers, and so we invite you all to come out and support us and also, you know, get free food and candy. Who doesn't like candy, right? Next up is the crop walk. 
Hunger, as we all know, is a very big problem worldwide, but it's actually also a really big problem in our community. And so the, this will be our 27th year doing the crop walk. 75% of the monies raised stay not only in Sussex County, but this part of Sussex County. And so Sunday, May 3rd, at the Bethany Beach Bandstand, you can go online or on Facebook to register to walk, or, and you register as a team, you register as an individual, as a family. If you don't want to walk, you can still come out and support us. There'll be, again, food and entertainment. And if you don't like to register online or you don't, you're old fashioned, you like paper and pencil, see Pastor Rob, he has packets, he can get you to register that way as well. And then finally, you've been hearing us talk about this for a couple weeks. And last week I said the abundant life is a life filled with lots and lots of, and I kind of left it there. This week I'm gonna tell you the abundant life is a life through Christ is what we're going to be exploring in our next sermon series starting April 4, April 12th, say April 14th, April 12th, which is right after Easter. We're going to be exploring living a life filled with different, how to live a purposeful life, how to make a difference in your community, and then how to stick with it when things go tough. Because those of us can tell you, you start living a life in Christ and we actually discussed this at our small group Friday night. You start living a life with Christ, things get really, really good, but then things get tough. And so we're going to talk about all of that and much more starting April 12th. But before we begin, and we, I'm going to get off the stage and let Bryce sing, I want to pray. So would you pray with me, please? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come to you today striving to live abundantly striving to live a life filled with you and filled with your purpose. We pray that we make a difference in our families' lives, in our community's lives, but more importantly, in your eyes. Be with us today as we worship and glorify your name. Be with Pastor Rob as he delivers his message, and may his words be your words. May we leave here with hearts filled with you and glorifying your name. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray, amen. amen. And would you stand? Will you pray with me? Dear God, I just ask that you anoint us to be your servants and priests in the world. You created us, and we are, we, there are 7 billion people in the world, and if we all did something, what an impact and change in the world that we could do for everybody who truly needs it. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Let's say amen. Amen. All right, amen. All right, and uh, we're getting to the part of the service where I talk about, oh, uh, everyone, you can please have a seat. <laughs> Relax. You guys did a good job, by the way. Good singing. You Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But um, this is the part of the service where we um, about to take an offering. And, um, you know, I just, I just want to tell that the Odyssey Church runs basically on donations. We get a lot of financial donations or even physical donations. A lot of the stuff here is donated. Um, the stage was donated by a friend. We have, a, and really, your donations are something that really benefit the Odyssey Church here. It really feeds our ministry. And it allows us to be able to reach out to the community of Selmaville that we really need to reach out to. So um, if, you guys, or if you guys are ready, I'll just go and lead you right into the prayer. Um, dear God, we come here humbly this morning. And I just pray that um, as we have passed the basket around, that, this, that whatever is collected is here to bless your ministry here at the Odyssey Church and bless the greater community of Selmaville for the people who really want to, who need to know you as their friend. I just pray that as the service runs on, that we bless the pastor and just give him the words he needs to speak to feed the congregation today and, of course, feed the community. And I pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen.
tell, we're getting ready to start a sermon series in a couple weeks uh, called The Abundant Life, as we've been talking in our never-ending series, or what must feel like the never-ending series, because it feels that way to me, called Reverse the Curse. But I appreciate you all coming out this morning. Yeah, I know it's early, and it's good to see uh, everybody so bright-eyed and ready to go and had their coffee. But we've been studying Jesus through the eyes of a, of a guy by the name of Matthew, a guy we know as Matthew. And we've specifically been in the last six months of Jesus' life, his earthly life, as he's headed towards a Roman cross. Now, he's headed towards a Roman cross for a specific purpose. He, he's going to be the sacrifice for all mankind. He's going to reverse the curse that God has put upon the earth and everything upon it. Uh, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and... The fall of man took place. So if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, turn it into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. That's the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. And if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. Uh, the words are going to be up here on the screen. And I want to remind you, there's Bibles right there by the front door. You can take them as you leave. They're free. There's no charge. It's, uh, it's always good to have your Bible and follow along and be able to write in it and take notes. So just take one as you leave. There's no charge. They're free. We want everybody to have the transforming Word of God. Now, I like to use my imagination a lot, so as you're turning there in your Bibles, I want you to try to imagine this picture before you. I want you to try to see what's happening in your mind's eye. And here's how the story starts out. And I say story, it's, it's a true account, it's a historical account that Matthew's recorded for us, along with Mark, and sometimes when you take these pictures and put them together, you get a little bit better idea of what's going along. So, it's almost time for the Passover feast in Jerusalem. So there's people that are gathering there. There's probably hundreds and thousands of people uh, walking along this dusty road going into Jerusalem to take place in the festivities. And like most people, they're probably walking in groups with their families or their friends. And as they're walking along, they're to celebrate this great feast this Passover feast, which represents their exile or their exodus as they were freed from um, captivity in Egypt. Now, Jesus' ministry is on earth is about three and a half years long, and it's just about the end of his ministry. So where the, he was in the last six months, that's what we have started now. He is just a couple of weeks away from the cross. And in the last six and a half months or six months, Jesus has been preparing his disciples for what's to take place. He's preparing them for what is going to be the cost of his ministry. Jesus has told them what was going to happen, that when he got there, he was going to have to suffer, that he would be uh, dying, that he would be risen again. Now, we know he's told them at least two times because Matthew records it twice, once in chapter 16 and once in chapter 17. And in chapter 16... Jesus pulls his disciples together, and, and he, he says that he is going to go into Jerusalem. And, and the word says that he spoke to them plainly. He was telling them matter-of-factly. And, and I believe that it was probably more than two times, because Matthew starts out by saying, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly. From that point on, he began to tell his disciples, and what he told them he made very clear. He said it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised again. Now, like I said, we know he told them at least twice because it's recorded again in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22 and 23, where it says Jesus told them the Son of Man. Jesus uses a different title for himself. He uses the Son of Man, which what he used most commonly for himself. Jesus told him the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. Now, he adds a new detail. He says, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the enemies. He will be killed, and on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Now, this at least the third time Matthew, or Matthew records that Jesus is going to tell him what is about to happen. And, and I like the way Mark sort of describes it. Mark describes a scene like this. There's all the people walking down the road. Like I said, if, if you've ever been on a walk, like, like the cross walk we've talked about, people sort of gather together in groups they're familiar with. And as they're walking down the dirt road to Jerusalem, they're not alone. There's people that are following them that they know. So you can sort of pick, 
picture Peter, James, and John, and the other nine disciples, even Judas is there at this point in time, and they're walking together, and, and they're walking with some of the women that God has been using in his ministry. And, and you can sort of imagine a conversation that was going on. They're talking about what's going to happen. It's probably a pretty lively discussion. And, and we know that as they were walking along, at least those that were familiar with Jesus, they were a little apprehensive. The crowds were actually fearful. Mark tells us they were now on the way to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. So you sort of picture this in your mind's eye that, that Jesus is walking alone. He's up in front. The crowd of his friends and disciples are behind him. And, and he says that disciples were filled with awe and the people following them were overwhelmed with fear. On the way to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way and the disciples are, are in, in behind him. And they are filled with awe. Now that word actually translates to stupefy with surprise. They're, they're walking behind. They're stupefied with surprise. The disciples were astonished. They were anxious. They were a little fearful. But the crowd that was with them, the women particularly that were with them, as, the, as, as we look at this story, they were overwhelmed with fear. But Jesus is not walking. His, his pace is just a little bit faster according to the Gospel of Mark. And as he's walking ahead, I can sort of picture him. He, he just sort of stops and turns around to him and calls him into a, a little private meeting. And so there is no misunderstanding. So there's no question as what Jesus is about to say. He talks to him plainly. And in this private meeting, he begins like this. He says, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately. He's got this private meeting. They told him what was going to happen to him. He said, listen. We're going to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will rise again. Now that can't be any clearer. He tells them exactly what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem. And it's been recorded at least three times by Matthew. Five times if you include the times that he was talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It's five times that Jesus has told them what is about to happen. And each time in his prediction, if you read the word as it progresses, he adds new details. This time he's added the detail that he would be mocked, that he would be flogged with the whip, and he would be crucified. As he gets closer to the cross, he begins to give more detail what is about to happen. Now, we sort of made the cross uh, an instrument of love, uh, uh, something we put on the back of our cars. It's, it's something we wear around our neck. But if you live in Rome at, at that point in time in history, you know exactly what the cross meant. The crucifixion was a method of deliberately and slowly and painfully executing a contemned person. You nailed them to a big wooden cross. You put a 125-pound beam across their back. And you just sort of left them there to hang until they die. And if you ever wonder how much God really loves you, or if you wonder if he loves you at all, you think what he goes through so that you can spend all eternity with you. And it's not like what's pictured, what we see on TV. It's not like the, the thing we saw on our small group on Friday night where people are able to converse back and forth. They can talk. But it, it, it's not a normal conversation. They are in immense pain. And they're not way up in the air like you see on TV where you know, they're up there looking at Jesus and Jesus is down looking at them. When somebody was crucified, it was the worst kind of punishment. It was horrible. People who were crucified were actually hung really close to the ground, only two or three feet off the ground. Sort of like the height of a chair. And as you walked along in Jerusalem, people sometimes would see dozens of people that were in different stages of death hanging on a cross. So you'd be walking along the road, and these people were purposely put out publicly, put along the road so everybody could see it. Now, if they'd been whipped and they'd been flogged, like Jesus said he was going to do, you'd probably see their torn flesh. A lot of times these whips had leather ends on the back. On the end of the leather, they had either metal or bone. So when they struck you with it, it would sometimes break a rib and it'd be sticking through, or at least you'd be able to see the, blown, uh, the bones coming through. And when they flogged you, they would put, first put you back like this and whip you in the front and then hang you over and whip you in the back. So it's not a, a matter of just beating on your back and your front's okay. You were ripped up from top to bottom. 
as you're walking down the street, they put them low for a purpose. They put them so you could see right into the person's eyes. So that you could look at them as they were hanging on the cross, their instrument of death. You could see their pain. You could see their, ministry, their, their, their misery in their eyes. You could hear them grasping for air for the very next breath. And, and what they did is they would nail either both feet, in Jesus' case, ankles together, and as you're hanging there, the only way to get a breath, because your, your body kept your lungs closed, was to push up on these nails, take a breath, and come back down. And every time you did, it just pain because you're pushing up as the nails are through your bones and through your legs, you would scream out in pain. So, so as you're walking it down, it, it really incorporated all your senses. You see them, you hear them, and you could smell the blood in their, their bodily fluids, and you could smell uh, their sweat all mixed together. People on the cross didn't normally die of loss of blood. They didn't usually die of pain. They died because they could no longer push their self up. It was too painful, and they actually suffocated to death. And Rome per did this purposely. It was a form of control because if you saw somebody on a cross, if you saw how agonizing their death was, you smelled the blood, you smelled the sweat, you, you could hear them grasp for air. You never wanted to do anything that would put you on a cross. It was a form of control because it was such a horrible, excruciating, agonizing way to die. So again, if you don't ever wonder how much God loves you, you think you love you, remember this, Jesus went purposefully and intently to the cross, knowing exactly what he was going to have to face so that you could spend all eternity with him, so that you could live with him forever. Now that's a love, that's a love so deep that it's beyond our human comprehension. And you would think, after Jesus had told all of his disciples this, they would be mortified. They would become more than all. They would become overwhelmingly fearful. At least, at least they would be asking questions like, why? Why do you have to go through this? Uh, how does this work into God's plan? The scripture says when the Messiah comes that He's going to free us. How is this going to free us? How is that going to happen? You'd think that at the very least, they wouldn't be talking, just walking down, thinking about what Jesus had said, but not Jimmy and John. Not James and John, as the Bible calls them. They want to be into a place of honor. So they had their mom go to Jesus and ask them a favor way right after Jesus has said all this. Now, verse 20 in the King James says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, Zebedee is the father of James and John, with her sons, and she was worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask him a favor. To which Jesus said, Woman, what is your question? Actually, it doesn't say that. I'll just sort of put that in there. But the word of worship, the word that the New, the King James says worship, the one that's translated here that says uh, that she knelt respectfully, uh, what that actually means is she came there and she laid prostrate out in front of him. She came to Jesus to pay him homage, to be respectful, to have reverence. And he says, what is your request? He asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the places of honor next to you, one on your right and one on your left. Can you imagine Jesus is responding? He just told them everything that was going to happen. And she comes and asks, Hey, you know, after you're flogged and whipped and beaten to death and you come on cross, uh, can you let my son sit on one hand and you sit on that and the sit on the other? We like to think to ourselves that we wouldn't ask that question. I mean, after Jesus had just told him he was going through, but you know, if we're, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we do it all the time. We focus more on what Jesus can do for us than what we can do for Jesus. We focus more on what makes us happy, what brings us honor, what brings us glory, rather than what we can do for Jesus to give him honor and to give him glory. We're like disciples. We just don't Yes, sometimes. Here Christ is talking about his own suffering and his own execution. 
And the disciples are talking about their own honor, their own honor and their exaltation. I mean, there, there's a contrast here between man and God. And we're supposed to be Christ-like, and we're not. Jesus shows us the selfishness of our own hearts. And most of us, and again, I think if we're truly honest, I mean, I, I'm just putting this out here. I know, I know it's the way it would be a comment. Deep down in our own hearts, we don't come to church to seek the God uh, of the heavens above. We don't come to seek Jesus and worship Him. We sort of come to church to see a genie in a bottle. You know, we come to church and say, okay, God, I'm coming to church and I'm praying. Now you have to grant me my every wish. There was a man, a, a worship leader of a big church called uh, Faith Living Church, a man by the name of uh, Judah Thomas. And uh, I actually made sure this was accurate because I, I Googled the church and looked it up. He's the worship leader there. He said he was in a supermarket one time, and here comes this lady, and he said he could barely see her head over the top of her grocery. She got a big grocery cart, and he said he got a little scared because she's coming right at him. And he's standing, and all of a sudden she screeches about two feet in front of him, looks up over her grocery and says, I left your church. He's like, well, that's good. I think if you left my church, then you made the right decision. In fact, if it's my church, I think I'm going to leave the church too. She said, don't you want to know why I left? He said, he's thinking to himself, not really, but I have a feeling she's going to tell me anyway. And he was right. She goes, you weren't meeting my needs. The answer said, because I never even recollect meeting you, let alone talking to you about your needs. Did you ever tell anyone specifically what your needs were? She said, I, you know, I couldn't remember if she did or not. So he raised another question to her. And he said, can you tell me if we, and this is a big church, and there were 5,000 people there. He said, if we have over 5,000 people sitting in the church, and all of them have the same attitude you have, how is anybody's needs ever going to be met? I mean, if you reserve the right to have this kind of attitude, then you have to get everybody else to have the same attitude that you got. And if everybody's got the same attitude, now I think we all know, anybody that's been in church for any length of time, that this happens in every church. And it even happens in this church, and we're sort of brand new. We've already had at least one family basically tell me the same thing, and, and they left our fellowship. Now, I'm not condemning them. I understand. I know people don't come back a lot of times, especially if they have children, because we really don't have anything for their children. And I know that because people have told me that. Now, now we're going to have, and we're working in that direction, but we don't have it yet. But when the person I'm talking about decided to leave the church, you know, my response was, how how are we ever going to meet your needs and your family needs if everybody who comes here doesn't help out and they leave because their needs aren't being met? And I asked this person, I said, why not be part of the solution instead of the problem? What have you done specifically to help fix our problem? Now, of course, that didn't get her to start helping. It didn't get them to uh, stop from leaving, but I think the point was made. We're never going to be anything but what we are until we get people that have a vision of what could be and should be in the church. It's up to us. It's up to me and you. It's up to the people that are here today, the Odyssey Church, the people who come here to make a difference in the lives of others. You know, just, if you just have a few people, it, it's not going to be possible to do everything. And I'm not criticizing. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. Oh, we are so fortunate. I mean, I... I, 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 I talk to a lot of pastors. I, I speak to a lot of church. Some have hundreds and some of them have thousands of people. And when they see what's going on at this church, I mean, it's almost as if they're envious. When they see the percentage of people that help out here compared to the, you know, you got 2,000 people in your congregation and they can't find somebody to watch the door and they hear about all the people and all the work that happens here. I mean, 100% of the people here almost are doing something. Some people supply food. Some people come in and clean the church. You know, Randy and Jennifer were here all day yesterday making sure today service and the signs are up. We are very fortunate. Almost everybody does something here, but there's always room for more. We have churches now that are emulating the things that we're doing, and we're only six months old. We, we have churches that have requested to be on our, our email list so they can see how we're doing the things that we're doing. And I'm just proud to be part of this church, and I'm proud of those that come to this church. But this woman, Judas Thomas, is talking about it's like some of us sometimes. We just want to stand our ground, you know. She said, well, then you tell me who's going to do all the need meeting. 
and Judas Thomas says, you know, I almost felt a sense of relief. He says, I, 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 I just had to look at her and say, I thought you'd never ask. And he says, this is what's going to work. He says, when people stop sitting in the pews saying, they're not meeting my needs, and start saying, whose needs can I meet? The needs will be met when the servant spirit begins to flourish in a congregation, and then they can minister to each other as unto the Lord. In other words, to, to purposely misquote the words of John F. Kennedy, don't ask what your church can do for you, ask what you can do for your church. And I've been in church for a long time, and again, I, this is not this congregation, but I've been in a lot of churches, and I just have to think to myself, you know, when did it become popular to come to church to be served instead of coming to church to serve? You know, the key to the Christian life isn't seeking what Christ can do for you or seeking what the church can do for you. The key to the Christian life is what can I do for Christ? What can I do for others? Christ's message from the very beginning was, I love you. I love you so much that I'm going to die an agonizing, humiliating, cruel death to serve you so that you can come and spend all eternity with me. So if you don't get anything else out of this message, please get this. We're not saved to sit in chairs. We're not saved to sit in pews. We're saved to help serve. And don't misunderstand me. I mean, we are saved by grace alone. We are saved by faith alone. We are saved by Christ alone. But Jesus' own brother, James, said the manifestation or the evidence of our faith is our good works. Now thankfully, and I love this about God, he is so long-suffering, he has such grace and such mercy. If you look at this, Jesus, our loving Savior, doesn't rebuke James and John for saying this. He doesn't get mad at them because they came and said that just like us. He doesn't get mad at us when we do that. He just tries to draw us closer to him. He doesn't rebuke us. He, says, he just simply says to James and John, but Jesus, James and John, but Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? And what some of you may not know is all through the scriptures the cup is a symbol of suffering. It's particularly true in the New Testament as it applies to Jesus. You see Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he's there, he's about to drink the cup of suffering. He's about to pour himself out. And he prays to his father. He says, my father, if this is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, as he held a cup up. Jesus drank of the cup and he poured out all he had. Jesus' own willingness to submit to the Father's will, even to the point of death, is just an example. It's a picture. It's a physical picture of a spiritual truth of Christian service poured out to its fullest. An example of what he calls each one of us to imitate. A life poured out in service to others. If I am, or you are, or any of us are really looking to, to Christ in our life, we will be poured out to service for others. We'll be poured out in Christian service. So the question I, I'm sort of asking this morning, are you willing to drink of the cup? Are you willing to pour yourself out? You know, one of the things I, I saw one time, it was this, it said, we all want to be in God's army as long as we're in the parade and not in the war. Is there anybody here that's ever been in the service? First of all, I thank you for your service, for the freedom that we have to do what we're doing here now. But let me ask you, Rob, the uniform you see on TV with all the medals, the Marine uniform with the sword, if you're in Navy, the white, uh, is that the uniform they wear most every day? No. The Army, Navy, most of the time the uniform they're wearing is a uniform of service. It's the fatigues. It's a, it's a uniform of battle. That probably, <coughs> Not very often do you wear those dress whites or that dress uniform. You wear the uniform of service, the uniform of fighting. It's easy to say you'll serve until you see what the cost is. You mean, and again, I, it's hard to talk here because so many people do so many different things. But truthfully, in most churches, everybody says we'd love the church to grow just as long as I'm not the one having to do the work. 
So the question is, are you willing to drink of the cup? Are you willing to pour yourself out? And, and notice, he doesn't say, will you? He said, are you willing? Because God says, if, if you're willing, he'll make a way. He says, oh yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When James and John says, we'll drink, they didn't know what it was going to cost them. They didn't know that, that for at least one of them there, that they would be martyred. They didn't know the other one was going to be exiled. They simply meant, we're willing. So as I look at this, you know, I began to think, why does, why does Jesus start this, or why does Matthew start this section of Scripture out with Jesus talking about the cross? Why does he talk about what he's going to have to do when he gets to Jerusalem? And I think he starts the story out with Jesus talking about the cross because Christian service is always in the direction of the will and the direction of true Christian service is always towards the cross. We're always walking towards the cross of Jesus, keeping our minds on what's to come. The will of the heart has to be the cross. The cross is the beginning of this account because the cross is always the beginning of Christian service. Until you see what Jesus has accomplished for you, what he did for you, it's hard for us to go out and do for him. Jesus doesn't rebuke James and John because the direction of their heart was of service. When we say we will, Jesus says you shall. Now, that doesn't mean we're able. God will make a way if we're willing. Sometimes the positions that we have in Christian service isn't because we're the most qualified. It's simply because we're the most willing. So are you willing to drink of the cup? Because God never asks you anything more than your desire. Are you willing to pour yourself out? Because when he sees your will, he'll give you the ability. What God takes you to, he'll bring you through. And if you notice, he doesn't even get mad. He doesn't even rebuke James and John for competing. He doesn't tell James and John, don't compete. I mean, he doesn't tell them not to try and outdo one another and everybody else. I mean, he created us. He, he knows that sense of competition is on all of us. He knows we all like to be number one. It's been put in our souls. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, we have to compete. But notice what Jesus does. He changes the direction of the competition. James and John said, we can drink from the cup. We can go all the way. Now that we said yes, you know, can we have what we asked for? And Jesus shows them that true Christian service is about what you can get, not about what you can get. It's not even about what you'll lose. Jesus says, don't follow me for a reward. Don't even count the things you're going to lose. If you serve me, you're going to have to give some things up. You may have to give up some of your time. You may have to give up some of your money. You may have to, to give up some of yourself well, but you serve not for a reward. You serve like Jesus served. You serve for the glory of God. So what he does is he changes the competition. He says, you want to compete? Good, says Jesus. Let's see who you can love the most. Let's see which one of you can serve the most. Let's see which one of you can give the most to others. Let's see who can minister the most. It's okay to compete, but look at what you're competing for. <clears throat> now, I just thought about this. I mean, and this has been a difficult week. I've had to deal with some battles in other churches, battles in, uh, in this area through a lot of churches that have been very difficult. And I, I'm thinking, to say, if we would all just get it in our heads to serve as Christ served, what would our churches look like? What would our families look like? What would our jobs look like? What would our communities look like? If just those of us that call ourselves Christian would do that, how much would that change? If we get trying to get ahead for our own benefit, but instead was in competition with every other Christian, every other person who said they were Christ to see who could serve their fellow man the most, how would the world look? If just the ones of us that call Christians did that, Jesus says, compete, abandon your rights, drink the cup, pour it all out. Follow Jesus, lay down your rights, your needs, live your life for Christ, and pour yourself out for others. You know, I, I see people that come to church every time the doors are open, they sing all the songs, they even quote the scriptures, but they're not truly living for Jesus. 
Is your life, you have to ask yourself sometimes, is your life truly being poured out for others? Is your life truly in Christian service? Now, here's the strange part to me, because Jesus doesn't rebuke James and John who just come and say, can I say your right hand and your left hand? But he rebukes the other ten. He says, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Now, indignant means strong displeasure. In other words, when everybody else saw James and John asking Jesus to sit at the left and the right, they were mad. And you think they would be mad because of everything that Jesus said. But I don't think that's the case. I think they were mad because James and John wanted to be first too. I mean, they all, the other ten wanted to be first too, and James and John cut in line and asked Jesus first before they could. And how many times has that happened in our life? Their hearts had been revealed. They weren't mad because they, they were willing to serve. They were just ambitious as the other two. And these other two had cut in line in front of them. But notice, Jesus doesn't drive them away. He, he tries to draw us closer to him. He tries to drive each one of us. It's sometimes these circumstances so he can draw us closer to himself. He doesn't get mad at us. He doesn't rebuke us. He simply said, but Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people and officials fought their authority over those under them. He says, I just want to point out your mistake. Let me explain to you your wrong thinking. It doesn't work that way in my kingdom as it does here on earth. In man's kingdom, we come together and you want to have power and you want to have riches and you want to have all these things so the people around you can serve you. Man's kingdom is centered around palaces and thrones and honor. You try to be first so you can be served. But in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. There's this burning desire to take care of God's people. There's this burning desire to accomplish God's purpose, to follow God's will. God's kingdom is centered in the hearts and the lives of his followers. True Christian service isn't about exercising power over people. It's, it's not about exercising power over them so they can serve you, but about serving somebody else. Jesus says, among you it will be different. Among you that are in the body of Christ, among you who are my disciples, among you who say you're Christians, it will be different because whoever wants to be a strong leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. And then he gives the greatest example in Scripture. For even the Son of Man, even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as ransom for many. He says, here's how it works in the world. You get authority so that other people can serve you. It doesn't work that way in my kingdom. You get authority so you can serve others. Not so you can be served. Concentrate on serving, not on being served. And Jesus wants his disciples to grasp this. It's so important to him. He says, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. If we're to understand our service, we must understand the service of Jesus. If we're to understand our service, we must understand His service because they're both the same. The way to become great in the kingdom of God is by becoming a slave. The way to be a leader in the kingdom of God is by being a servant to others. But honestly, you know, we're human. Sometimes we think more of ourselves than we do of our Savior. We think more of ourselves than we do of Jesus. And, I, and I've never really thought about this before, but... I tell you, it was really convicting me when I thought about this. Can you imagine how our prayers must look to Jesus? How they must look to God sometimes? How our worship must look like from heaven? Jesus, can you do this for me? And Jesus, can you do that for me? And when I get to church, will you make sure it's warm and the seats are comfortable and the preacher don't talk too long? And I know this happens because it's happened to me. I mean, do we come to worship God or do we come for our own convenience? If we're really trusting in Jesus Christ, if we're really seeking Christ, if we're really resting in Him, we'll be willing to drink of the cup and our lives will be poured out for Him even unto death. Our Maker, our Lord of Savior, that became our servant. Our focus shouldn't be on what He can do for us, but what we can do for Him. And then on what we can do for others. I mean, if Jesus didn't do anything else, if we really understood the penalty of sin, if we really understood what it means when Jesus talks about the internal flames of, of, of hell, 
We just understood that if he offered us nothing more than salvation, he's done more for us than any of us deserve. And if we would realize how, how great that is, how wonderful heaven will be, then we truly put away all this other stuff and we become the people in the church that God has called us to be. We are God's people by creation. We are God's people by redemptive. He made us and he bought us. And we owe him our lives. We're to do what he created us to do, to put him first and to love others. To love him and to serve others. The manifestation of loving God and loving others is that we're serving God and we're serving others. The reason Matthew starts his entire account out with the cross is that is the eternal principle. That is to show us how greatly our God served us. The Lord drank of the cup. He poured himself out. He emptied himself. He gave us everything he had. And the question becomes sometimes, are we willing to do the same thing for him? Are we willing to constantly pour ourselves out for others? After World War II, some German students uh, volunteered to rebuild a cathedral in England. It was one of those ones that had been badly damaged by what they called the Luftwaffe bombings. As the work went on, as they progressed, uh, they got the cathedral rebuilt, and then there was this large statue of Jesus. And they had restored it, but it was a Jesus, and he had his arms stretched out, but a beam had come down cut the, the arms off and it had crushed the hands. There, there would seem to be no way to rebuild the hands and put them back together. So they're discussing how to do it. Finally, one of the students came up with an idea, an idea that was still there today. It, it, um, the statue originally said, with Jesus holding his hands out, come unto me. So what they did is they changed the, left the hands off and changed the inscription to read, Christ has no hands but ours. Christ paid the price. He purchased our salvation on the cross with his life. But he left the hands-on work, the work to be done here on earth, the work of building his kingdom. The only Christ people will see is the Christ in you and the Christ in me. There's a, a, a Wheaton College, I don't know if any of you have heard it, but there's a poster that hangs on one day walls in the office there. It says, the living truth is what I long to see. I cannot live on what used to be, so close your Bible and show me how the Christ you talk about is living now. Easy to preach the word. It's hard to show people Christ through our actions. Are you willing to drink the cup? Are you willing to pour yourself out? And I want to tell you why this is so important to me. I've met with people in my house here that tell me how much God hates them for either their lifestyle or what they've done in the past. Now, I know this isn't true, but in their minds, they believe this. I've met people that have severe anxiety and severe depression. I counsel people whose marriage is on the rocks, who their family relationships are falling apart because of adultery or lack of a communication or anger or any number of reasons. I deal with people constantly that are diagnosed with life-threatening diseases, with cancer. I, I, I talk to people that don't have a lot of time left on this earth. I, I did a funeral recently, and, I, and I'm not a judge. Not a judge. Don't try to judge any man's heart. That's up to God. But my guess is that most of the people that were at that funeral that night died today. They just went hell wide open. I, 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 I meet with people every week that have all kinds of problems. I meet with people that have drug addictions, alcoholism, pornography, financial problems, you name it. We live in a lost and a dying world, and time is short. Now, I don't know whether Christ is coming back in my lifetime or not. I don't pretend to say that, but whether I come to him or he goes to us, time is short. we got one day less today than we had yesterday. And I've tried to the very best of my ability to cast a vision for the Odyssey Church to show you why we do here is so important. I don't know how to tell you any better than I already have. I need your help. Jesus needs your help. Here at the Odyssey, we're trying within our human ability and our limited resources to take an ordinary worship and make it extraordinary. And we do that so that we can be in the hands of Christ because he has no other hands but ours. We're fortunate. We're more fortunate than most churches because most of the people come here serving one way or the other. But honestly, it's not enough. 
there are a lot of people I love and a lot of people I know you love who aren't being served, who don't know Christ. And we don't have to ask us whether we think God wants us to serve. We don't have to pray that prayer at all because the Word makes it very clear that we're called to serve. Jesus needs you. He needs me to be His hands. And this isn't so the Odyssey Church can grow. It's not about the Odyssey Church. It's not so that we can have a good name here at the Odyssey Church. But let me assure you of this. If the Odyssey Church becomes known as being the hands of Christ, if the Odyssey Church becomes known for serving others, we can't help but grow. Why it's so important now, why the message is now, is because we have an upcoming Easter service that we have poured ourselves out. We've taken all our money, we've taken all our effort, and we have put it out there. And we're praying people will come, but the worst thing that can happen to us is if people come and they have a bad experience, because it's hard to get them here the first time. It's almost impossible to get them back the second time. And we need a team of people to help us out that day. We need an outreach team so that people that come can be followed up on. We need a team of people who can help us assimilate new people into church. We need a team of people who can uh, help make disciples. See, it's real easy to make people Christians. It takes a lot of effort to make people disciples. Making Christians is easy. Making disciples is hard. We need a children ministry. We need a youth ministry. We need a young adults ministry. We need a prayer team. Because I know this, God wants to do something to us and through us, but we have to be willing to do our part. So the question I want to leave you with, the questions I should say, are you willing to drink of the cup? Are you willing to pour yourself out? Are you willing to be the hands of Christ? Because I'm counting on you and he's counting on you. Why? Because we're all he has. We're saved to serve. He has no hands but ours. So if you will, uh, as you leave here today, uh, Randy's going to hand you a card, and on that card are some areas of suggestion our lead team has given uh, where we feel we need the most help at. And I'm not asking you to make a decision today, I'm just asking you, will you please pray about being part of our team by helping us become the church, by volunteering to help us fulfill God's vision of what could be and should be. As Jennifer said this morning, we want you to get mad. We want you to make a difference. Will you drink of the cup? Will you pour yourself out? Will you let God bless you by blessing others? Will you be the hands of Christ? For he has no hands but others. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you for just the number of people in our church that are working showing Christian service, pouring themselves out for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can be part of your body, that we can go out and show others the love of Jesus. And Father, we do pray for our Easter service. Father, we pray that you'll bring the multitudes and that their hearts will be open and their eyes will be open and their ears will be open, that they'll be spiritually open to your word. And for those that just come Easter and Christmas, maybe, maybe this will be the day of their salvation. Maybe this will be the day that they come to church and realize how much you've done for them. Lord, help us to be prepared for that service. Help us to have the teams in place. Help us to make the experience so great for those people that not only will they want to come back, they'll want to bring a friend with them. Father, help us to be your hands here on earth. And we thank you for the privilege and the pleasure of serving you and serving others. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the blessings of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and within you this week, wherever you find yourself, serving God and His Son through the power of His Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Thank you.